Welcome everybody to Frankston City Libraries. I'm Marnie and today we have uh, Paul Kennedy, journalist and author, um, and of course local, which is always my favourite. Um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which uh, Frankston City Libraries operates, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respect to their elders past, present and future. And of course, I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to any of the elders of any other Aboriginal communities who may be joining us today. Now, of course, we do have PK today. Um, there is a chat function um, in Zoom. So if you want to pop your questions in there throughout, um, I can read those out. Um, depending on time and all that kind of jazz, we may even open the microphones up so you can have a chat to Paul. Um, but for now, I will hand over to Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Marnie. And uh, I can't see people, but uh, oh, there we go. Sorry, poor framing. Uh, but um, it's great to, uh, to do a frank talk. Uh, this is a bit unusual for me because um, all I'm doing is talking at my phone. And uh, as those of you who've watched News Breakfast might uh, recognise, I'm doing it from the place where I've been um, reporting the news news breakfast for the past couple of months i've just uh got a bit of light in here so we usually have that closed but um everything else is pretty similar um but as i said uh and as marnie mentioned if you want to ask questions of me please go ahead and we can make this more of a chat than me just uh, uh banging on and and maybe um moving into areas that you're not all that interested in uh, i've got a few different areas of interest in my professional and personal life so i'm happy to talk about anything and uh, we can have a bit of a chat. I've uh, just got myself a, a coffee from the pod machine at home. And uh, in honour of the Frank talk, I have uh, Frankstonized my, my desk a little bit, uh, put up a dolphin's jumper. This was my, um, one of my favourite and saddest uh, photographs. That's why I put it in a frame. My brother put that in a frame for me. We both love Peter Dacos. Uh, he was our favourite footballer growing up. And um, we both adored Darren Mullane, who sadly died in 1991. Seems like yesterday when my mum came in and uh, opened my sliding door to my bedroom and, and with tears in her eyes told me that Darren Mullane had died uh, in October 1991 after a car accident, after he'd been uh, drink driving. So, um, yeah, seems like yesterday. It's, it's uh, 29 years, in fact, since that happened. And... Um, and I played, by the way, the Frankston link is strong there with the Mullane family. Sean Mullane, Darren's brother, played at Frankston for many years and uh, he was a, a, a crowd favourite there as well and, and a good friend of mine. Uh, this um, book should be known to everyone who has been to Frankston, knows Frankston and loves Frankston. Um, this is called All the Green Year. And uh, this is a copy that belongs to a friend of mine, Mick Ellis, who I need to give it back to. <laughs> Uh, but he uh, he lent me his copy of All the Green Year. Some of you would have probably known about this book from school. It was in the school curriculum, I believe, in the 70s and 80s. I didn't read it at school. I only read it probably in the last couple of years. But uh, Don Charlwood was a, was a poet, a well-known writer, who grew up in Frankston in the 1920s, late 20s. And so when he came to write about it, he called it, it was a novel, so he um, changed the names. He called the town Cannonook. But every sentence, every paragraph that he describes the area, you'll be able to uh, understand that he's talking about Frankston. Uh, it's a coming of age story. It transports you straight back to the 1920s. So if you're interested in local history, read it. I know it's a novel, but it serves as a, as a great um, history. It's almost a, a time capsule, really of what life in Frankston was like in the 1920s. So I can highly recommend all the green year if you can track down a copy. Um, I'll have to, I promise, I'll have to give that back to Mick Ellis <laughs> at some stage. Um, now, uh, having uh, dressed up the desk, I, I just wanted to, I'll, I'm always unsure, and that's why your questions will come in handy, I'm always unsure what people would like to hear from. Um, some people like to hear what life is like at the ABC. And I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, obviously, I've been working from home because of the circumstances. Uh, home for me is Seaford, and I grew up in Seaford. I um, grew up in Emmanuel Drive, which is 
over the other side of the freeway, if you know the area, Seaford was established and um, had houses in it for a few decades before the 70s. And in the 70s, after they built the freeway, they opened up and cleared a new housing estate. Some people call it Belvedere. Probably is big enough to have its own place name, but um, uh, it was uh, it was called Seaford, just like the suburb of Seaford itself. Just call it Seaford, they said. So, um, yeah, I grew up there. We were one of the first houses on the street. I grew up with um, my mum and dad, my brother and my two sisters, and um, I had a great upbringing in that housing estate in Seaford. Those parents, by the way, that moved in in those years are all having their, if they're still together, um, are having their 50th wedding anniversaries. And I recently wrote a story about my mum and dad's wedding anniversary. They got married in 1970. And uh, yeah, I was born in 75. I was actually born in Seymour Hospital. Uh, we lived in Puckapunya Lib. Dad was still in the army. And then a couple of years later, he got out of the army and the army was allocating uh, properties um, around the different parts of the city. But one of those areas was Seaford. So a lot of the, the people in that area that, that I grew up in were, were related to the army. And I've got friends whose dads were in the army as well. And they landed in the same area. So that's how we came to be um, in Seaford. And uh, I just love the area. Everyone was so young in those days. All, all the kids on the streets, all the parents were really young. And, and now um, some of them are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. So it's all happened. So really quickly, but my uh, link to the area has never really been broken. Mum and dad are still in the same place. My brother lives in Frankston. My sister lives in Frankston. My other sister lives in Seaford. And I live in Seaford where I raised my uh, three sons with my beautiful wife, Kim. So, um, yeah, and uh, having walked around the uh, Seaford streets in the last few days uh, with the beautiful sunshine, the, the, the old swamp, I put a photo on Instagram of the old, what we used to call the swamp, which is the internationally uh, recognised and protected wetlands, which is basically a link to, an unbroken link back to um, the days of the Bunwurrung tribe and, and how it looked before the rest of the swamp got drained and made into housing. We've still got that beautiful area and, and of course, the beach. Um, uh, one other subject that I wanted to mention today, and it's happening right now, there are messages going out of, the, the local paper is not going to be made anymore. And there was a decision made not too long ago that um, uh, the Frankston Standard, among all of the other leader newspapers, was going to go online. And it became official today. News Limited put out its statements that all of those papers would just be moved online. Now, if you understand the ins and outs of that, it basically means that you know the paper's not going to exist in the way it did. Um, there are subtleties, I guess, and, and uh, perhaps News Limited might say they're going to deliver the local news differently. But um, Paul Amy, who is my senior journalist, and I'll, I'll walk you through my, my uh, newspaper experience in a moment, but Paul Amy was my senior journalist, a great friend of mine and the best teacher of a, a young journalist could ever have, tweeted about half an hour ago that he believes the Frankston Standard was going for about 130 years. So that's the biggest change I think we're going to see in uh, in our suburb, in our area, in all areas, and for quite some time, that the local newspaper won't be there. My link to newspapers is pretty strong. I left high school at uh, the old Seaford Carrum High School, which became Patterson River, and uh, was in a bit of a, uh, a an aimless state there for about a year. But I really wanted to become a journalist, so I, I badgered the Herald Sun or Herald and Weekly Times to give me a job as a copy boy running errands around the newsroom. And after the year after that, I was able to go to leader newspapers and ask for a cadetship. One year before that, I went and sat with a leader newspaper editor like, uh, called Tom Wiles. And uh, on leaving high school, I asked for a cadetship and he said to me, what do you know about the uh, newspapers? What do you know about newspapers? We're working in a newspaper. Um, and in a newsroom and I said nothing because I had no idea about anything other than wanting to play football and he said well how am I going to hire you when you don't know anything about the job that you're applying for and I said to him how am I going to know about that job unless you give me a job uh, he, he gave me a wry smile I think um, maybe maybe it was a, a more of a flat expression and just said you need to go away and find yourself some experience 
So that's when I, I, I went and got the copy kid job, which took no experience, just a bit of uh, willingness. Did that for a year and then went back to the leader and eventually uh, Tom Wiles said to me, well, now you've got some experience, you know what it's about, now you're ready to become a journalist. So I was positioned uh, in the old Cheltenham office for leader newspapers, which turned out a whole heap of different mastheads, including the Oakley Times, the Oakley and Springvale Times. Um, there was, so that, that was my first round. I did a few weeks on the Brighton paper and then got moved to the Oakley paper. I sat next to Paul Amy, who I mentioned before. He was in charge of the Dandenong area. So uh, Dandenong had its own paper um, and mine was Oakley. And he was my, that, that's how local, sorry, that's my, another phone. Uh, he was my um, senior reporter. So he was my mentor and that's how it works. You had a couple of newspapers, uh, a couple of reporters working together under a an editor and then you had camera operators or um, or snappers as we called them and um, away you went that was the newspaper and then you had the, all of the sub editors uh, who were just amazing uh, banks of knowledge as well they would fix your copy if your copy was um, not up to scratch they would let you know about it uh, if you produced a, a good piece of writing or even worked up a good, a, a nice sentence, then they would let you know about that. So you had instant feedback and that's how I learned to be a journalist. We had cadet classes in Blackburn. Uh, every Tuesday we'd drive to Blackburn and uh, sit there for half a day. Sometimes we would discuss editing and sometimes we would uh, talk about um, the, the ethics of journalism, which we were heavily invested in. And although some people scoff at, uh, at News Corp as, a, as, as an entity, uh, News, News Corp owns leader newspapers and I would argue with anyone that um, there was no superior uh, training for a journalist than those cadet classes and working with Paul Amy and, and the environment that we, that we um, learned our trade in. And, and I do believe it's a trade. It's not an art or anything like that. It's, it's a trade. You have to learn the trade. And that's what I did. And very early on, we covered all sorts of stories in the newspapers. And uh, by the way, I've, I've gone away from Frankston Standard, but Frankston Standard was the, I never worked on Frankston Standard. I worked on the Mornington Leader after Oakley, but the Frankston Standard was A grade and um, there was no better paper than the Frankston Standard. So anything I'm talking about here, you can relate to, to your experience if you have one of reading the Frankston Standard every week including the classic old sports column pot shots, which, I, which was basically my, my reading <laughs> when I was young. Um, early on, I did a story about a pedophile priest in Oakley. And this is a, a good example. Many of you hopefully would know of the work of Chrissy Foster and Anthony Foster in raising awareness for survivors of, of clerical abuse and going up against the church and uh, I helped Chrissy write a book called Hell on the Way to Heaven in 2010. But way back in the mid 90s, um, I took a call from a local politician in Oakley. I reckon I was only six months into the job, still a cadet. And he said, you need to get out to uh, Sacred Heart and there's going to be a meeting tonight. There'll be parents there. You need to turn up. This was a Monday or Tuesday night. And I said, what's it about? And he wouldn't tell me and just said, you need to turn up. So I took my notebook and pen. That's all I needed. Um, went to the old church there at Sacred Heart and um, went into the back. There was a parents meeting around a long table. All the parents were sitting there basically trying to work out which of their children might have been abused by the local priest. I wrote a story about this um the news story was that they were seeking some sort of support and action from the archdiocese of melbourne and the breakout story that i wrote was without naming the woman it was about a woman who read a piece of paper she'd written down her thoughts and i wrote it's what we call a color piece on that so it was a front page lead breakouts news story on page three and a 
a story about this woman also on page three. So I took out the two main pages of the, of the newspaper. Uh, that woman was Chrissy Foster. And uh, much later, of course, uh, went on to write that book with her. I was thinking this morning about that story and I could name so many other stories that would now be unwritten because of the, uh, the plight of suburban newspapers. So when you hear the news tonight on, on TV or you hear the radio news and there's a snippet there about some journalists losing their jobs and local newspapers um, ceasing to print weekly copies. That's what I'm thinking about is all of those stories that might go unwritten. And um, for a journalist to get the story, uh, you need to turn up and need to be there. And um, if you're not there, then, then what happens to that story? And if it's essential that somebody is there to record it so that they can uh, spread the word and write about it so the public can read about it without any of that, um, where, where might be the justice if people are, are being treated unfairly? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I could, go, I could go on and on about that, but that was, um, that's what I'm thinking about today, those, those stories that are, that are now going to be lost to the local community. Not to mention, uh, on a much lighter note, I guess, but, um, but still really important to me, is when I was growing up, I used to look at all the scores in the, in the papers um, my personality was such that I've looked forward to perhaps getting my own name in the paper. Uh, but, uh, you know, I read the best players in the, in the football and who scored the most runs in the cricket. Um, the wonderful Simon McAvoy has, has been a stalwart of sports reporting in Frankston at the Frankston Standard for a long, long time. Also a prolific run maker for uh, Lang Warren as a batsman. Um, and those are, they're all going to be lost now. You can't, um, I know things are different. The commercial pressures on News Limited and advertisers is not going into print. I know all of that, but I'm just talking about what a shame it is. Um, from the, just to talk more about my experience with newspapers, uh, from the Oakley Times, I, I got posted to the Mornington, Mornington Stand, Mornington, Le Mornington Peninsula Leader was the masthead. And I worked under another, I was lucky enough to work under another senior reporter called Peter Tomlinson, who was Paul Amy's equal. And uh, she was, they were, they were exactly the same. Prolific, hardworking, relentless, um, lovely, affable. They could speak to anyone. The newsroom down at Mornington was, was the same as the office that Paul created in his um, part of the, um, part of the office at Cheltenham was um, a place that people could come, tell their stories and know that they would be heard. And I was very fortunate to have Peter Tomlinson at that time where I was coming towards the end of my cadetship and I was becoming a bit restless as a, as a reporter. I wanted to go and get bigger news stories and, and try out TV or, uh, or radio. And um, yeah, Peter was great. And I, I remember one story that she did, which, sticks in my memory I remember lots of stories actually one of them was um, uh, one of them was when Jerry Lewis came to town and uh, spent some time in Sorrento and uh, of course he'd left by the time that we found out about it we weren't uh, we weren't on the money there and um, or on the ball I should say and I had to go to Sorrento and find out where Jerry Lewis had been and which restaurants he'd eaten in and what he did while he was there it turned out to be one of the um, one of the most fun stories that I, I've ever done. And I found out there was a revelation to me that Jerry Lewis went to the local shop, I forget what the restaurant was, and that he'd asked for brown chicken meat instead of white chicken meat. And before that, I didn't even know that you could get two different types of chicken. But he was very specific, and now I know the difference. But um, I was playing footy at Frankston at the time, and my teammates read that story and laughed at me. They thought I was being ridiculous, chasing Jerry Lewis, the ghost who'd, uh, who'd left the country. Um, but Peter Tomlinson did a story that I still think about every time I drive through Mornington. It was the best front page that we had, and it was a picture of, I forget who the photographer, maybe Ian Cook, um, perhaps who worked on the paper. It was a photograph of a green hill with all of the houses on top of the hill. 
and it was a story about the urban sprawl finally making its way to Mornington, perhaps maybe in 1998. And uh, there was a big debate then around that time because the urban sprawl was, was arriving, whether or not there might be an opportunity to have uh, shops attached to Main Street. And there was a big fight between Main Street and these department stores that wanted to, to move in. And I'm sure that anyone that's been to Mornington recently would be um, would, would understand what I'm talking about because now, 20 years later, it's uh, so very different and all of that development did happen. And um, I was staggered by the way when I drove past the old, uh, the old house once owned by the Reverend James Caldwell. Uh, and, it's been, and it's the Andrew Kerr nursing home now and they're, they're actually building another building right next to it. So, Anyway, that's um, something that annoys me after the uh, the book that I wrote on 15 Young Men. Hey, Marnie, do you have any questions there? Because this is where I start to question whether or not I'm rambling. That's, <laughs> that's all right. I was actually going to comment on the local yeah. media. I don't have any in the group chat yet. So if you want to pop them in there, pop them in there. Yeah. Um, but it's days like today. Like I remember when Fairfax bought out The Independent. Yeah. And it became the weekly and then it went to online and then it just disappeared. Mm. And I feel like with Corona coming in, the leader went online um, and it's, it's taken the opportunity to just disappear as well, I think. Mm. And um, it is days like today that I'm really thankful to people like Cameron McCulloch who came out of the independent and said, this isn't okay. And yeah. we need our local independent news that isn't driven by a Rupert Murdoch. Murdoch. Um, that tells our story and values community news. And I just, I'm just really thankful that people like that took that risk um, for their families and their livelihoods to keep something like Mornington, to create Mornington Peninsula News and for Frankston, the Frankston Times, and of course the Southern Peninsula News and Western Port News. Um, but it is a really, really sad day because for me personally, I'm on the PR side of things. I've worked closely yeah. with a lot of the people you're talking about, including Paul. Um, and just having those relationships and knowing the impact of an announcement like today has on those individual people and their livelihoods um, and their values around journalism ethics um, mm. and having studied journalism and sports journalism. Um, I'm absolutely hearing what you're saying um, and I can't help but sit here and feel really, really sad for things like, you know, my daughter was the Christmas cover of the leader two years ago, like things yeah. like that. I know I've yeah. been in it myself. My brother has been in the sports pages for his golf scores. Um, things like that. Yeah. It just, it just disappears. And what does that mean for our community? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not uh, overly optimistic actually um, on what it means because I think, uh, I think all of those things are just going away. I knew that the, the decision when the, coronavirus came and they made the decision that everything was going online and they were, they were standing down um, normal operations. I knew that was the end and it's been coming for a, quite a while uh, because uh, News Limited, uh, News Corp has been wanting, I think, to make this decision for its business model. Uh, the advertisers haven't been there. Um, you know, it's the, the, the papers recently have been a slip of what they used to be. Um, there used to be more than 100 pages and, and there haven't been that for quite some time. So I guess I knew that it was coming and you look at other uh, uh, places overseas that have lost their newspapers. Um, uh, so there are, two, there are two things, those local community connections that you mentioned. Uh, that is massive for me. Our, our most popular part in the paper used to be uh, What's On and the What's On column. And there was a pain, pain in... in uh, in my side because uh, as a cadet, all you want to do is write big front page stories and uh, you think you can at that stage. And uh, I had a large part of my job was writing the what's on column. And you had to say someone had a garage sale or, uh, or an anniversary or a, a, some sort of event and you would have to write the, you know, the who, what, when, where, not why, but <laughs> you had to get all of those facts right. And if you didn't get the facts right, you know, if there was a number wrong in the news, in the, um, in the telephone number or uh, or anything amiss with that, uh, people would be outraged because that was their local news and they re relied on you to get it right and let them know what's happening, even if it was that that big in the newspaper. So that local connection is real and I felt that having worked in it. 
but the other side of it is, you know, there are disputes that need to be resolved. And, uh, you know, it's not just big government that will take advantage of people if they haven't, if they're not being scrutinised by a good media. It's local councils will as well. And so what happens if they're making a big planning decision and people need to know? Um, the answer from the authorities might be, well, you know, we, we put signs outside and you need to look, look at the sign and you've got your opportunity to respond to this. And, but the media is how people uh, learn. That, that's how they find out the news. And, and don't worry about this um, debate around fake news and don't be misled by, by the screechings of of uh, international leaders or local leaders you know the news is there to inform you and um there is you know there are so many good journalists that are not going to be there telling stories to you now so that's that is a real shame and those those journalists are properly trained these these journalists in local newspapers aren't uh aren't swinging in without any training they learn they, there are requirements that they need to um, go through a cadetship. Uh, they're not put in positions of responsibility at community newspapers if they can't do the job and they can't do it well. So uh, don't be thinking that there's some sort of tin pot operation that's going. This is this is um, a first class watch house on on the standards of our lives. So yeah, I, I'm. It's got to be another way. I mean, people need their local news, don't they? So, so what's going to happen? You know, how are we going to get our local news? I love the local history sites that are cropping up on, on Facebook. Don't get me wrong. People have, have got these wonderful, uh, the Frankston history site is a ripper. Uh, there's a Karen history site that, I've, that, I, um, that I pay close attention to. People are posting old photos. All that sort of stuff, I think, will probably look after itself. General interest will reach and um, and spread on social media. But uh, who's who's going to ask the question of the mayor that's been doing the wrong thing, or the or or the councillor that's not acting in our interest? Who's going to hold the local member to account when it's when the story is not quite not quite flashy enough for the for the Herald Sun or the Age? Um, you know, who's going to follow through and, and make sure that the local business person's not doing the right? The right thing. So I used to go and sit in court, and every Tuesday I go over to the magistrates' court in Dandenong. And I did it at Frankston as well. You sit there and listen to all the mostly committal hearings, but then some matters would be small enough, um, seemingly insignificant enough to be done within a day. But they come up, they read out what had happened. You know, it's good for people to know what's, uh, you know, even if it's a misdemeanor, what's happening in the, in the local courts. Uh, I did sit through council meeting after council meeting. And, and keep an eye out for a story because it was important, even though it's one of my worst experiences ever to sit through too many council meetings. I was, I was going to say, it's the one thing I don't miss about being in media. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you were there and we sat there and they knew we were listening. Absolutely. What happens, what happens to power if, if they know we're not listening? And I must so, say, one of my, uh, my favourite things to do was to catch up with the journos straight afterwards, to have a chat, yeah. see what they're thinking, um, is there anything that cropped up for them, and also just to say hi. It was our one opportunity of the month to just say hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, mm. I feel a bit flat about it, but... Um, I, yeah. I've, and, and also, I've just so many good friends of mine have um, probably going to, to lose their jobs. Uh, I'll find other jobs they're highly skilled people on. I've, I don't fear for them, but um, I, I am sorry that they're not going to be providing that service for people. And journalism's copped such a, such a, um, a raw deal in the last few years. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's interesting to talk about. You know, <laughs> I think it's too. certainly timely. It's certainly timely. The fact that it has been announced today. But you did mention earlier How on the Way to Heaven that you co-authored uh, with Chrissy Foster. Now, yep. that was a key component in the push for Australia's Royal Commission into Child yep. Sex Abuse in the Catholic Church. How did that make you feel, knowing something you put your heart and soul into with Chrissy? Mm. How did it feel that your storytelling had that impact? Um, the, the book with Chrissy is hard to describe uh, for me and how I feel about it. Uh, because it was, um, it, it's just so sad, and it's um, and it's still 
it's still very, very sad um, because Emma Foster died. Katie has suffered as, as she has. Um, and Anthony died only a few years ago. And, um, uh, you know, he should be alive and Chrissy shouldn't be by herself. And so I became very close friends with uh, the Fosters. And for me, it's, it, it's difficult um, to even talk about actually, uh, uh, increasingly difficult because I used to be able to talk about it quite easily. Mm. But in a nutshell, I, I see my role in helping, and this is how it started for people who don't know. I covered the story in the 90s. Emma Foster died 12 years later. I was working at Channel 9 at the time. And I went around to the Foster's house and asked them whether they wanted me to cover Emma's funeral for a story for Channel 9 News. And they said yes. My news director uh, at the time uh, said yes to the story. He said, this is an important story. And uh, Michael Venus is his name. And I would, uh, I would credit him for making that key decision that this is a story that needs to be told. Uh, after I covered the funeral, I remember having coffee with Chrissy and Anthony, just as a follow-up. Um, and Chrissy was just, you could see that she needed to tell her story. I recommended that she speak to um, someone in the, in the book industry. An agent was the person that she spoke to eventually and then a publisher. And they suggested that she uh, would benefit from the help of a journalist to help her tell her story. So my job then was to help Chrissy uh, in doing that, um, understanding the nature of, of the story, we, it became an investigative journalism um, like, of, like I'd never done before. Um, and she, she had documented her fight against the Catholic Church so well that, um, uh, that that was a great help for me in my role as um, chasing down at different parts of the story. And in the end, uh, I was helping her find her voice through writing, but also we were, we were chasing what would otherwise be called news angles and um, who, who covered up what and when. And so from then I would, um, I would just keep telling myself that this is my job. And although it was emotionally uh, testing and, and uh, you know, still is today for me to even think about what went on. Um, my job was as a journalist to, to help Chrissy tell that story and to get the truth and to help, if possible, um, make justice more accessible for those many survivors. And so I guess I have some pride in being able to do that job well. I believe I did that job well. And um, beyond that, uh, I can't say that I take great satisfaction other than just a pride of, of doing that job and, and serving uh, my purpose as a, as a journalist there. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and, and made some great friends along the way. Uh, you know, I'm still good friends with Chrissy. Uh, there are other people, who, and they would know who they are, who I would see at everything, parliamentary inquiries, Royal Commission hearings, um, you know, they have small meetings that no one knew about. Uh, I would see them everywhere and I would see them getting feeling stronger and more confident every time. And those people were so inspiring to me. And I don't think I'll do anything uh, more important than that in journalism. So, uh, I was going to yeah. say, helping Christy to tell her story is... I, I, I couldn't want for any more of a legacy. I think mm. um, I think everyone here would agree with me in saying that what you helped her do, um, I don't even have words for it, Paul, to be honest. Yeah. It's, it's, Thank you. Yeah, I, I can't even put it into words. It's such a legacy and I think you should be very, very proud. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I am proud and my, um, you know, my parents remind me of that as well. I never have thought about it in, in those terms of, of legacy and, um, and achievements. I just, uh, you know, I, I just think, and it gets back to what I'm saying before about, you know, as a local newspaper reporter and then someone said, turn up at the meeting. Mm. So I went there and I did my job and, um, yeah, I'm proud of doing my job. And to be honest with you, um, you know, 
without uh, becoming emotional about it, um, you know, I'm proud of being a journalist and, uh, you know, being able to achieve, achieve that goal of providing justice. And it has. The Royal Commission was earth shattering. That Absolutely. Royal Commission was something that we could never imagine when we wrote that book. Mm. We hoped there would be an inquiry at state level. It happened. We hoped that somebody would call for a Royal Commission and it happened. And, um, and the credit goes to, not to me, but to, to all of those advocates and survivors and to the wonderful work by the likes of Joanne McCarthy in New South Wales. And there were so many more people, anyone at the Ballarat um, newspaper, uh, there were others in the ABC and beyond. Uh, 60 Minutes did an amazing interview um, back in 2002. So, so, and Four Corners did a great piece in, in the mid 90s with Ken Smith as an MP just speaking out. So, uh, I was one one small part, but I was part of a uh, a very fine body of work from journalists in Australia who who complemented the the courage of survivors. Absolutely. Now, Colette has asked, do you think the media in general are unfairly accused of misinformation? Uh, well, this is what I tried to avoid earlier, Marty. <laughs> um, well, yes, I, I do. Um, the public has to understand um, that they, they have a responsibility to, to source the news, you know, in a responsible way. There are responsible news outlets and then there are those that, um, that uh, jump on misinformation and, and try to feed that to the public. You know, I had a friend who's um, someone on Facebook recently who put a, uh, who put a post up of a media release about um, one, of those, one of those drugs that hasn't been proven to be effective <laughs> against COVID-19, you know, and, and really sticking it to the media, saying, yeah, you guys got it wrong and, um, and all the rest. Well, that's, that's not true. So we um, might have a mutual friend. <laughs> Yeah, that's not true. So, um, you know, not a bad person. I, you know, in fact, a, a, uh, someone that I really like. But um, uh, yes, I think that I think you, we've got to learn to ask more questions. And the the public has a don't just put it on the journalist and the media. The public has a responsibility. Yes, and and their responsibility also is to question the ABC. I'm not getting away from that. Question the ABC question the way we do things and scrutinise your public broadcast and it belongs to us all. Um, but also provide some scrutiny on other media outlets and question where you're getting your news and whether it's good enough, you know, and whether it's good enough for uh, whether the credibility um, is strong enough from people who say outlandish things, and I don't, don't want to get into name calling or anything like that. It's not not my go. But um, if, if you've got a if you've got a an opinion maker in the news whose credibility credibility is shredded by saying something ridiculous and getting something completely wrong, well, that that credibility carries over to the next story, the next story. You've got to you've got to take that um, that onus is on you to understand where you're getting your news from and understanding the conflicts of interest between news providers. Uh, because, you know, one news provider <laughs> is, is often an opponent of another's. So they're going to, um, they're going to criticize each other. So I think maybe, you know, um, I, I certainly don't want to play the victim because we've, we've got to uphold standards and any time our standards aren't as high as they need to be, then uh, I expect criticism and I welcome it. But um, the general public needs to, needs to act against apathy and make sure you understand where your news is coming from before you start criticising um, that information. Rory's also made the comment, um, I know that News Limited, Channel 9, Sky and now ABC are definitely guilty of it, misinformation, bias, talking over ignoring opposition. Some are good though. Quite good though, the bulletin has proven itself of late to be quite honest, accurate and unbiased. But I think it also comes down to personal beliefs, opinions of the person assessing it mm. without going into the likes of John Laws, Alan Jones, etc. Yeah, I think, I think the, um, the left versus right argument has been unhelpful in recent years. 
Um, and I think that's caught on with the public too, which seizes on left and right. And with that, you ignore uh, perhaps the, co the important context of a story uh, or somebody who's trying to make a point might be dismissed because they're left or right. You know, th I, think that's, I think that's degraded our, our public debate. Um, and, and certain opinion makers, highly paid opinion makers, seize on that and they know it. You know, they, they know that it gets people. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to put people into two tribes, isn't it? Um, but, you know, not everything's left and right. I think if we, we pay a bit more mutual respect to, um, to our opponents, or, or people have different ideas, they don't need to be our opponents, uh, mutual respect, common sense, all that sort of stuff that my dad, uh, <laughs> my mum and dad instilled in me when I was growing up. Um, sometimes I hear my dad's voice when, the, when these people are carrying on and I think, you know, we just need a bit more respect and, uh, and common sense and, and why, are we, why are we disagreeing and, and, and hating someone that's got different ideas? So, I don't know, yeah, I, th I think everything being left and everything being right, it's, not, it's unhelpful. And of course, the, Ameri the way that America has unfolded in the last 10 years or 20 years as well has been really unhelpful. And I think um, we, we should use the opportunity now to, to break away from that. Um, you know, we've got a prime minister who's, who says he's going to talk to the unions and, you know, that's, that's good. Let's, um, let's see how people can work through those issues together. Absolutely. Um, now, I will touch on quickly um, 15 Young Men. Um, yep. It's a book, I, I'll be honest, I haven't read it yet, but it is a book that ever since it came out, I've always wanted to read it. And... I actually didn't realise you'd authored it. So when I when you were coming in and I, I did some research and I went, I actually went, oh my God, Paul Kennedy actually authored 15 Young Men. Um, what what prompted you to write that story of that tragedy? This one goes back to my uh, time as the local newspaper reported Sir down at Mornington. So there was a memorial on the corner of Main Street and the Esplanade and the memorials for the footballers. And I didn't realise it at first when I used to go out there and, and have my lunch and sit near it. Um, and then I read it and it's like anyone, you can, your mind starts to take you to what it's like for a whole football team or majority of a football team to die in those cold waters. And if you're wondering what the weather is, <clears throat> was like at that stage, you can do what I did uh, a couple of years in a row and go down to the bay right about now. It's 28th of May. 21st was the anniversary, so last Saturday you would have had to do it. <laughs> but if you wonder how cold it is when those players hit the water and struggled for their lives, then uh, go and jump in the bay now and see how long you... you uh, no, don't do that, don't. <laughs> Hang on, take I'll be my, back. <laughs> take, take my word for it. It's cold. And the bit, I guess there were questions that I wanted to try and answer in the research too. Um, primarily, why didn't anyone make it ashore? Why didn't mm. they survive? And, uh, you know, learning about cold water immersion and the things that happen to your body, physical, physiologically to your body, uh, that was part of working out that it was, would have been impossible to make it to shore. But also, you know, why didn't they send a, a rescue party out for, the, for the, uh, the boat to search for the football team while there were weather conditions there? And, um, you know, the Mornington Historical Society, when I decided to write the book, the Mornington Historical Society with Janet Groves, who's got a personal connection there, um, and Diane and Keith White, who, who are wonderful people, they gave me access to so much history. And Trove was, was the gem for me as well because um, searching on Trove for those old newspaper reports, um, that, was, that was like uh, like I imagine it would have been to discover gold in Beechworth and then... <laughs> And want to tell people about it, it was so uh, just every I had the bones of a story uh, or I had the sketch of a story and then all of that color came from the local newspapers and talk about mentioning if when I circle back talk about mentioning people um, the personalities of the people in the boat were revealed to me by scouring through the old uh, Mornington standard newspaper and finding out that uh, um, you know, Willie Coles, who was, who was in the boat, had um, played his instrument and, and was a star performer at this musical event at the Mechanics Institute some six months earlier or whatever. And so that his musical uh, background uh, was, came forth through that. And you knew that, um, uh, you, knew that uh, you know, Hugh Caldwell and um, 
by the Grovers. You knew the Grovers were good, were good at sport. You knew they'd be good at football too because they were so good at cricket. And you'd look through all the old cricket scores and hey, Grover, this, particularly J.D. Grover, who was the uncle who wasn't on the boat, but he rode his horse to Morty Alec that night and back. He was one of the town leaders who, who helped build the town. And you knew that he, was, he was, loved his sport because if you go back over the years and he was the guy, instead of making between zero and 10 in the cricket team, like most of them did, yeah, he'd post 30s and 40s and those big scores. So, uh, yeah, so I got all that information out of the local newspapers and put it into the book. Um, the one thing I would like to mention, though, and uh, this was happening just as COVID-19 uh, came to us, I have been recording the voice, the voiceover for the book in for 15 Young Men with 3RPP on, down there at Mornington. And when we get it around to it, when we can get back to it, I'll voice the other half of the book and we're going to put out a free um, audio book or a free podcast. It's more like a, a podcast, a uh, half podcast, half audio book because I'll read the book online on, on, that, um, on that service and then I'll put in some extra commentary and we might do a couple of little things around that. So I know there are a lot of people that would have liked to read the book that um, might be vision impaired or... Um, or, or elderly and just for some reason can't can't read the book. So, yeah, we're going to do that and it'll be a, a, a free free option that people can get on their, their phones or their laptops. Well, that's so awesome. When, you, when you do finish that with the guys down there, let us know because we can also help to okay. share that and get it out to our communities. Yeah, great. Yep, yep. It's, uh, well, the thing was when you write a book, um, you then, if you've got an agent or the publisher, they'll try and, on sell it to different parts. So they might try and sell the film rights or they might sell it to audio books. No audio book um, maker want, has shown any interest in it, which for me, I, I think is good anyway. I'm happy to do it myself and uh, have people not pay for it. So yeah, look forward to that later in the year. Uh, 15 Young Men uh, audio book. Awesome, we can't wait. Um, now I do have a question from Colette again. Uh, what is your opinion on false balance media coverage of issues such as climate change, leading people to believe that the consensus of climate change science is much lower than what it is? Is the onus on news consumers to decipher information? Uh, the fair and balanced reporting, I, well, I, I think it goes back to what I said before. You have to, um, you have to share some responsibility on where you're getting your news from, um, but certainly at the journalists need to um, need to be well informed on the subject that they're reporting on and uh, uh, they need to ask the right questions the the um, you know the question always arises around balance but if something is if, if there is a matter that has been proven and uh, scientific evidence is overwhelming then the the, the practice is not to provide 50 50 coverage of of you know opposing views we have to um, look at evidence ourselves and then report to you in a fair in a fair way so i always approach anything i do um, and ask myself constantly whether i'm being fair um, so uh, yeah that's that's how i would answer that and, and whenever i'm interviewing politicians uh, i always ask myself that same thing Am I being fair? Um, not am I giving 50% there and 50% there, um, but informing myself, doing my own research, and then uh, asking myself constantly, am I being fair? And, uh, and am I asking the questions that need to be asked on behalf of our viewers? Uh, or if I'm writing something on behalf of the readers. But um, uh, certainly, I, I'll probably speak for a a lot of people at the ABC, not just myself, when we when I say that we are constantly aware of our role and that we are doing our best to be fair and accurate. And uh, if mistakes are made, then it's up to us to fix that. But um, you know, we, we constantly need to ask ourselves those questions um, to to provide the highest standard possible. Because you know, it's that the ABC is funded by the public and it belongs to everyone. Absolutely. Now, you were a player at Frankston Dolphins um, yes. and then a player coach at Seaford. Um, 
out of your time at Seaford, that's when your short film came about, correct? Yeah, yeah. Do we you want to tell we were, us a bit about that and the impact it had on the club? Uh, yeah, we were lucky in the um, at Seaford because a couple of things came together. I was working at Channel 10 at the time and then my last year as a player coach, I was at Channel 9, which, uh, which basically um, caused me to, to hand over the reins there as the coach. Also, Kim was pregnant with our second son, so there was a couple of things were happening there. Luckily, that was the year that we won the premiership, the, the, the Division One premiership in 07, and then we went uh, back to back to back. But um, after the 07 year, I think it was in 08, the Melbourne Film Festival had a thing called Footy Shorts, and Footy Shorts was a, a short film festival based around football, and you, you could submit a short film on anything. And... Because I had a lot of cameramen mates and still do, I used to get them to come down to the club and film the games and in behind the scenes. So we had all of this footage of, of Seaford. And then we did some interviews around how we progressed through a difficult time with um, drug use at our club. Mm. So the film was called Drug Game and it was about how basically how we at Seaford Football Club determined that we needed to give our give our club back to the community and that we understood that drugs were in a, were something that affected everyone and they were part of community and part of society but the premise was that a football club should be a place to get away from society's um, problems like drug use and so we had some rules at the club around drug use and and people who know there will, will who remember that time will un uh, understand how that all played out in the finer details, but um, basically, we, yeah, we wanted um, we wanted our club to be handed back to the people, and uh, th those are the members and the families. We were pretty strong at the time on on uh, cleaning up antisocial behaviour if we could, and uh, and making sure that the people could really take pride in their footy club. From that, we had some great success on field and off field. Um, I just remember more. Uh, women and children being around the club towards after a couple of years um, and it wasn't just me in charge there were a couple of other great people there Kevin Goodall was was central to everything so um, yeah and then from that we just cut a five minute video and uh, or film and uh, and sent it into the Melbourne International Film Festival we became a finalist and uh, it was a spin out because there were 10 films and none of them had any sort of um, journalistic <laughs> journalistic intent like mine did uh, and then we we showed they showed it on the big screen at acme in federation square and we turned up and watched our film watch the uh little old secret footy club take uh, take its place on the big screen so that was good fun um halfway through it there was some line in it um which sounded too too intense to be true and a couple of people in the cinema started laughing because they thought it was a joke they were waiting for the punchline, basically, because all the other films were were humorous. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was nice. Yeah, a, a cameraman edited a friend of mine called Anthony Fitzpatrick. Um, he he just made it look really beautiful. So yeah, that was good. We were, yeah. we were on the big big screen down at Seaford Footy Club. No, that's awesome, and I, I love the fact that that. Um that turnaround had for Seaford Football Club to really bring it back to that family orientated mm. club, the heart of the community, which is what a football club is meant to be. Footy and cricket, the beating heart of the, of the community. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think absolutely. that's the challenge, challenge for all those committees out there. We've got lots of challenges now, but uh, yeah, the challenge is always to keep it relevant for, for your community and um, you know, anything you can do outside of sport to help, help your local neighbourhood. That really helps. Uh, our players, we, we started um, doing cleanups down at the beach and stuff that was well, supposedly uh, irrelevant to, to footy, but it just helped, you know, that just told people that we were there, we were there for them. Um, and yeah, it's, it's funny what happens when you, when you tap into that community spirit. A place like Seaford, I reckon, is a bit of a country town in the middle of suburbia. Carum's the same, I'm sure. Anywhere down the peninsula is the same, Frank and even Frankston's the same. Uh, with uh, with the dolphins, they get that community spirit as well. So um, 
I'm sure it's like that everywhere else. I do. I have always assumed that, but maybe it's not. Maybe we're just a special part of the world. <laughs> I think we are a bit special. I, I would agree with you. It's. Um, I think it would be cookie cutter in that regard around Australia. But I do find living on the peninsula, um, I grew up with Mount Eliza Redlegs um, and my brother played oh. with Nathan, with Nathan oh. Jones. And, well, you should have you know, said that earlier. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> so a good thing or a bad thing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I was the club babysitter, so I was babysitting Nathan Jones and oh, yeah. my brother was the best backman he's ever played with, apparently. Um, that was in under nines and under tens, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but now I'm a part of the Somerville community and now I've been here a number of years now and my daughter started primary school this year and it's really brought me back into the community. Mm. But the primary school, the main primary school, they've got the sculpture of the eagle in the front yard. Um, that their school uniform is the same color as the football jersey. Um, it is the Somerville Eagles. Everything's about us being con connected as a community. Um, with sport actually being a central player in that. Yep. Um, so can you tell us, I, I know we are running right, right on time, probably we'll go a little bit over if that's okay. Yeah. But I know you're a big advocate for youth participation in sport and I'm seeing the importance of that in keeping a community together. Mm. Um, did you want to touch on the work you're doing in that through the Fun Coach movement? Oh, that, that was a Facebook page that I set up. I've got to say, I don't post as much as I should um but uh, no. <laughs> yeah okay no no it's okay but uh i see good stuff there play by the rules was a sport australia organization i mainly just forward stuff from them i did some videos around youth participation um once again my dad was really informative for me when i was when i was young he was a coach that uh, didn't rely on uh, or didn't promote winning and losing as the main aim and, uh, you know, we had a battling team when we were under 12s or under 11s and 12s with Dad. Uh, and he was, um, he was just so good in that regard. He was, he was really fair and um, he, uh, he looked out for, for the kid who, who wasn't the star and made sure that he had a good experience and just got equal time on the field, basically, and got treated with respect. So it's, it's all about um, treating kids with the respect. If you turn up, you get to play. And don't sit on the bench. Um, there's no place for that in, in junior sport. Uh, I, I believe that there are some uh, parents who are nice and um, and well-meaning, but get caught up in trying to win premierships. And uh, you know, if you do that, you've 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 sort of lose your way a little bit. You tend to um, treat the kids differently. Um, that's not to say that you don't uh, you know strive for excellence in in all you do. You don't try and be the fittest team in the competition. You've got to be. That, that, I'm as competitive as anyone. But um, and the kids who are excellent, who who you know the the, uh, the Jones boys. If they if you see it, the, you know the Jones boys coming through your club, um, give them every opportunity to be the best they can be. And you know, at the end of the year, yeah, give them the best and fairest trophy because they deserve it. Um, Mind but, you, I've got to have a chat to Zach about uh, Dane Swan at some point. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's happening with that? He's the one that landed on Dane Swan many years ago. <laughs> oh, okay. Yep. Oh, Dane Swan landed on a few people as well. So. <laughs> fair, fair. Um, no, I think if you, yeah, if you get, um, you know, you've got a Nathan Jones in your ranks, you're beauty. Um, you know, get, get behind them and enjoy the ride and watch them play. And, but and I, I, will say, I will say, Paul, growing up, he was targeted. He was targeted mm. by a number of clubs. Um, and it was really sad to see a 19, 11-year-old yes. targeted like that for being really, he was really, I mean, still is very, very talented, but he is one of the loveliest people I know. And it was just such a shame to have parents and coaches yeah. treating children that way. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. I say it all the time, um, the good kids. Yeah. Um, having, having said, when, when I say treat all the kids the same, I mean treat them all with the same amount of respect. But, um, you know, the, the good kids like that, you've got to celebrate them as well. And, um, you know, yes, uh, look out for the kid that, that might only get, the boy or girl that might only kick the ball once or twice and celebrate them as well. But, yeah, I, I'm all about celebrating the kids who are, who are, who are guns because they're the ones who, who will stay up well into the evening and um, have to be caught inside because they're, they're kicking the footy to themselves and proving their skills. So, yeah, I hate that. I really do. I, I don't like... Um, parents that uh, take out their frustrations on, on kids who are good and exceptional. 
Um, the fun coach movement, as I call it, is not about um, um, taking down exceptional kids. And those are the ones, by the way, those are the kids who are competitive. And if you don't focus on the winning and losing and don't make it a priority, don't worry. They're going to, they'll get their experience. They'll lose and they'll be emotional and, and they're desperate to win. They'll have all that without you um, creating that, you know, the, trying to hunt premierships and all the rest of it. So, yeah, that's, I hate hearing about that. That's not nice that Nathan Jones had to put up with that because. No, but look where he ended up. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. Well, I hope that he looks back and remembers the good times of his junior footy because, uh, uh, you know, they, yeah, it's, it's great. There's, there's very little um, that, that is better than watching, you know, the kids go out there and do their stuff. And I love watching my boys and, uh, I love watching my sons. I watched about a thousand hours of cricket over summer, and sometimes it's excruciating if they get out and you watch them. <laughs> you watch the roller coaster ride they go on emotionally, but oh yeah, for me that's that's my hobby. Junior sport is my has become my hobby. Um, you know, I don't. Um, uh, that's my weekends basically. So work, family, and then junior sport on top of that can't beat it. No, it's the best. I, I look fo- look back fondly on those years standing out in the freezing mm. cold in the middle of June um, for my brother. So. Um, and it's funny we're talking about Nathan because Scott, who's a PE teacher at Peninsula Grammar, um, he actually really enjoyed 15 Young Men. Um, yes. And he's also interested in your football coaching experience. Now, I will, before you go into that quickly, um, he has said he's hoping our match against Mentone can go ahead in Term 3. Yes. Well, uh, so do I because I coach Mentone Grammar and um, I, I haven't got enough time to coach a club anymore. I would love to coach a club again. That's... Um, uh, was sort of like a 12 month job these days. Uh, it's just a bit too much. So I coach the under 14s at Carrum uh, with my boy Jack. And um, Gus is 12 now, so he'll be the under 12s if they play. And Leo's going to make his debut as a seven, turning eight year old this year as well. But um, just as an extra uh, hobby, I coach the Mentone Grammar team in the, uh, the AGS. So, yeah, we're looking forward to playing against Peninsula, hopefully. They're trying to get maybe three or four weeks of play in Term 3. And uh, I think we might even be playing at a neutral ground this year, which would be good because uh, not to be disrespectful of Peninsula Grammar, but that ground last year was it was at a poor, it was a bad time to play there. <laughs> down there. It was an absolute bog. Um, but uh, they've changed coaches now, so... Um, yeah, it'll be a good match. I'm looking forward to it. Um, yeah, the Mentone Grammar stuff is, has been great, actually. Someone asked me from the school whether or not I wanted to coach the year 10s, and they said it's only eight games a year. So I got on board and then took over as the first coach the year after, and um, I've really loved it. That's a great age group to coach, 16, 17, 18-year-olds, you know, coaching against some kids who are going to go in the AFL. And, uh, yeah, my kids go to public. Um, school, so they, they're going to Karen Primary and Paddo River, um, and this is really the first, the only time I've been involved with private school stuff. But uh, yeah, I like, really like the footy. There's a lot of passion there, and the kids are good. And it reminds me of when I was a yeah, a reckless 17 year old. So uh, yeah, that's good. But uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, Mentone versus Peninsula. We'll see how we go again. Awesome. Now I may I do have to wrap it up there. I think we could talk for okay. ages because I haven't even got on to Gavin Brown yet. So. We could, oh. we, could be, we could have been here for hours. Um, yeah, <laughs> Gavin Brown, Heath Shaw, Ben Johnson, let's just keep going. Uh, but we won't. Um, thank you so much, Paul, for joining us today for our frank talk with you. Um, for anyone that hasn't read Paul's books, uh, we do have them available on our RB Digital app, so you can borrow those for free. Um, if you wanted to purchase them, you can also get them through Robertson's Bookshop in Frankston. Um, so please join me in thanking Paul Kennedy. Do you have copies of all the green, yeah? Well, I've just written that down because I think I really want to read it. So we'll find out. It may even be in our local history collection. So we'll find out. All right. Thanks for having me. No worries. Thank you for joining us. And keep an eye on Frankston City Library's website because we've got heaps of Frank Talks coming up with some awesome personalities and authors. Um, But most importantly, please stay safe, look after each other, and we'll see you back in our libraries very soon. Um, Paul... I'm, I would love to get you back in at some stage um, and maybe we can right. get some autographs happening. All right. Well, I'll do the audio book and I'm going to, I'm am, uh, painstakingly writing another book. So, um, uh, yes, stay tuned.